Hello, and welcome to this presentation on model-based design of displays. Before we get started, I will ask Jason to give us a quick demonstration of the application that we will be designing today. So to be able to get you familiar with the application, we're going to immediately jump over to the actual executable that we would be deploying. So throughout the remainder of today's presentation, we're going to be using this as our reference application. In this case, we're looking at an instrument cluster that could go into pretty much any vehicle. And some of the functionality that we have inside of this instrument cluster is we have just a display for a speedometer and a tachometer. And by pressing the cancel switch, we're going to actually rotate into our main menu. And as we're in our main menu and scrolling through this main menu, we're going to notice that the center screen is going to follow suit and display the corresponding screen depending upon what is selected inside of the main menu. We also have the ability to go down into the settings menu of this application and actually go through multiple other layers and change settings inside of the instrument cluster. So overall, this is, I would say, a medium size complexity for an actual embedded application. And this is going to be the what we focus on for the remainder of today is designing this application out of a Simulink environment. For the standalone code, everything that you're seeing right now is a combination of graphical artifacts that were actually created by a tool that's made by DISTI called GL Studio. And that tool can then generate embedded code and deploy that down to the target. And then all of the state transitioning that you're seeing while button presses are occurring are actually being developed inside of Simulink also. So after we've seen the overall application, the next thing that we can do is actually look at the model and begin to familiarize ourselves with the model that could be used to develop this application. So there's three main blocks we're going to be using today. The first one on the left hand side being uh, switch input types. So this is basically allowing us to switch between if we want to be in more of a normal mode of execution where the user's interacting with the application just as I was, or we can switch to more of an automated mode. And in this case, we can have predefined test cases that can put input vectors into the remainder of the Simulink diagram where we can automate our actual test cases instead of having to manually interact with the design. The center portion that we're looking at here is the actual business logic. And the business logic portion is the section that's going to actually control all of the state transitions. So when a button press occurs or another type of event occurs, the state flow diagram that's inside of this subsystem will be responsible for actually going off and changing the state. So if we look under the subsystem, we're going to notice that there's a, a simple um, state flow chart and then under this state flow chart, we're also going to have a more elaborate design, which we've actually created inside of state flow, which we will get to throughout the remainder of today's presentation. The last block that we have on our top level model is this block over here on the right hand side called instrument cluster display. This block's purpose is to basically execute the actual graphical portion of our application. This block is actually a block that was made by DISTI and it's part of their block set. And this block basically allows us to load a DLL file from the generated C++ code. We would generate the C++ code from GL Studio, then bring the code into another build environment such as Visual Studio, then create a DLL file to be able to run that portion of the application inside of Simulink. Thank you for the quick walkthrough, Jason. So let us introduce ourselves. I'm Siddharth. I do technical marketing at the MathWorks and have a background in mechanical engineering. In my past life, I used to write software before I got into marketing. Over to you, Jason. Hi, my name is Jason Moore. I am a pilot engineer here at the MathWorks. Prior to working at the MathWorks, I actually worked at multiple tier one automotive suppliers. And while working at these automotive suppliers, I've worked on a variety of applications from different types of body electronics, such as instrument clusters, to more safety critical applications, such as ABS systems. Okay. So in today's webinar, we will look at how to apply model-based design for display development. Now, while we use an automotive cluster as an example, the workflow is applicable to displays used in other industries as well. So I will start with an overview of some of the common challenges with designing displays using traditional methods. And then we'll look at how to apply model-based design to solve them. Jason will then walk through the cluster example 
to show the workflow in action. So the first part of the demonstration is focused on using state machines for designing the business logic. We will then show how to integrate this business logic with the graphics, both for simulation and as a desktop executable. Now, the second part of the demonstration will show how to test the business logic and the graphics using requirements-based tests. We will also apply various design error detection techniques to verify our algorithms. The last part of the webinar will briefly touch on how to automatically generate code from the models and integrate the various parts of the displays application. So, let's get started and take a look at what is the main problem that we are trying to solve here. The key issue is the high cost of catching errors late in the design cycle. So this research by IBM states that almost 80% of development costs are spent identifying and correcting defects that were caught during the integration phase. So in a traditional development process, paper-based specifications form the basis of software for developing graphics and business logic that drives the UI. Now, it is hard to integrate these components and even harder to keep them in sync as the designs get updated. Now, the UIs are then visualized by deploying them to some hardware prototype, which might not be available early in the design cycle. This dependence on hardware inhibits rapid design iteration. The software is then integrated with all other software components. Now, since this is the first time that all software components come together, obviously most bugs are found during testing at this stage. So, let's have a look at how model-based design can solve these issues. With model-based design, you use high-level graphical models to develop algorithms for your business logic. These models are then integrated with the graphics through APIs. You can simulate the models on your desktop to understand your requirements and start testing your designs. Now these models can include algorithms from other components as well. So now you can see that you can test the complete application using simulation and catch design errors early. Note that all this is being done before any hardware is available. You can then automatically generate code from the models and test the software on the prototype hardware. So to summarize, with model-based design, you develop, integrate, and test your algorithms early in the design cycle without depending on any hardware prototypes. With that, I will ask Jason to apply this process to the automotive cluster example. This simplified workflow will be used to discuss the design, verification, and deployment of our display system. The first portion we are going to take a deeper dive into the design aspect of the process. The typical user only sees the front end of a graphical application. Even though the graphics portion of the application is front and center for the user, typically there's a rather large state machine running on in the background. In this demonstration, we have implemented the state machine in Stateflow using a combination of state diagrams and flowcharts. In Stateflow, we also offer the ability to create a design using a state transition table. A truth table can also be used if the logic can easily be described in this type of a format. As we previously discussed, the typical design is fed off of a requirements document. With this overview in mind, let's go to our model and look in more detail at the business logic portion of our model. So if we go down inside of the subsystem, we're going to notice that we have a single state flow chart. And inside of the state flow chart, we're going to notice that we have three distinct parallel states. The parallel state on the left hand side of our screen is for tachometer logic. This portion of the design is actually controlling what should be displayed on the tachometer portion of our screen of the instrument cluster. In the bottom right hand corner we have the center screen logic. This parallel state is determining what should actually be displayed in our center screen. And then lastly in the top right hand corner of our state machine we have a separate parallel state for startup diagnostics. All three of these parallel states can operate independently of each other and will be in their own state. You can also check between each one of these states. For example, in this case, I'm checking inside of my center screen logic to be able to see if the prove out has been completed or not. 
in one of the other parallel states. So it is possible to check to see what state another portion of the uh, state diagram is in. So as we previously mentioned, and we kind of went through in the design process that we previously just discussed, most designs should start off basically with a requirement. And in this case, we have a mock-up requirement for the center display screen. In this case, we're basically saying that we're going to have one input for the center display screen, and that's going to be a reset. We're going to have an output that's going to be sending out the value that should be displayed for the center screen and what the range and data type of those are going to be. Then we have functionally how the center screen should display. So in this case, we're basically saying that when ignition transitions from off to on, we should display the welcome screen until the system diagnostics are complete and the prove out has been done. After that has occurred, we should then display a blank screen for a period of 500 milliseconds. And then the interface value for the center screen in both of these cases, the value for center should be equal to five. And then in this case, it should be equal to four. And if we look at our model really quickly, that signal is actually corresponding to the center value that's being sent from the business logic directly to the graphics portion of the application. After that time period is passed, then we're going to go down to this table. And this table is basically telling us the menu selection item, the corresponding screen that should be displayed in the center, and what the interface value is. So for example, in this case, for, if digital speed is selected, we should send a center value of two, and we should display the tire symbol. So now if we jump back to state flow, and we zoom in a little bit more on the center screen logic portion, we're going to notice that our design is implemented pretty similarly to the way that the specification was laid out. In this case, when ignition transitions from off to on, which is our default transition, when the application starts up, we should display the welcome screen. And then basically we're checking the state of the startup diagnostics. And once it says that the prove out is done, we're going to transition to the default screen or that blank screen that we saw. And then after we've displayed the blank screen for a period of time, we're then going to transition to the main portion of our logic. And in this case, we're simply using this function over here. So basically center is being set to the return value of function A. And function A is simply a graphical function. So if we go inside of function A, we're doing basic if else logic inside of this portion. And we're basically checking to see what state that the tachometer logic parallel state is in. So in this case, if it's in ACC follow status, we're going to go through this path. If we're in range and fuel, we're going to go through this path. And if we're going to go through the digital speed path, we're going to check to make sure that that portion is selected. And if it is, then we're going to go through this path. So in this case, if we look back at our requirement, this portion of our specification is basically stating when digital speed is selected, center value should equal two, and this image should be displayed. So this portion of our specification is actually implemented at this portion in our design. So inside of state flow and simulink, I can easily right click on a transition. And since I've already selected a portion of my specification, I can go to requirements traceability, and then I can select link to selection in word. And what this is going to do is it's going to actually create an active link that's going to give me bi-directional linking from my state flow design to my actual requirement. So now if I go back to the requirement, we're going to notice that I have this MATLAB symbol here. And if I simply click the control button and then click on the link, it's going to jump me right to my design and it's going to take me to the portion of the design that implemented that uh, requirement portion. And then I can also do the same thing inside of state floor simulink. I can right click on the transition and then I can see that I have a link to this transition and I can easily jump back to the Word document. Lastly, one other item that I can do with requirements traceability is I can easily go to analysis, requirements traceability, and then highlight model. And in this case, what is occurring is we're actually highlighting all of the portions of the model that have an active requirement link. 
and I can go back up to each corresponding level. So everything that we're seeing in the orangish red color actually already has a link to a portion of our specification. Any item that we still see in gray does not have a link. So now that we've actually taken our requirement and implemented it inside of our state flow diagram, and we've actually linked the two, I can actually go back and simulate my entire application now. Okay, so now that my simulation has started, I can see that the graphics portion of my application popped up, which is, again, the block set that uh, DISTI has available, and we're actually running the graphics portion of the application. And while this is occurring, I can actually jump down into the business logic portion of my application, and we can see what's actually occurring down inside of my actual state transitioning that should be going on right now. So we can see that my center screen is in the welcome state, which is also what's being displayed. Now I transition to my blank screen and then I transition to the cruise control screen being selected. So the portion that we actually link to the requirements, if we jump down in here a little bit further down into the function, we're going to see the path of the logic that's actually being also executed right now. So as I transition from screen to screen, we're going to see that that path changes to basically change which screen is actually being displayed, which is what we would expect our behavior to, to do. And I can go down inside of my settings menu, the gauge will rotate in, and then I'm inside of the actual settings menu, which is also part of this portion. So I'm transitioning from main into the settings portion. One other nice thing that you can do inside of Stateflow and Simulink while you're actually running a simulation is you can set breakpoints similarly to other types of environments if you're just running a, a normal ID. So by right-clicking on any state or transition, I can basically set a breakpoint so that when the transition is valid or when it's tested that my simulation will stop at that point and pause. So in this case, I already have a breakpoint set on this transition and basically whenever it's valid, I'm going to trigger this breakpoint. So this is my transition from when I leave my settings um, portion of the menu and then I finish the rotation of the gauge, I'm going to stop right at that point. So if we do the exact same thing, I'm going to go back up to exit on my screen. So now that we can see I finished the rotation of my gauge out and once I hit the transition and it's valid that we're actually going to hit a breakpoint here. So my application is actually paused and as I scroll around through different portions of the state flow diagram I can actually see what the value of variables are at this point in time and I can have the option to step into a function, step out of a function, or step over a function similarly to how you could with another type of debugger. So in this case Simulink is giving you all of the same options that you would most likely get inside of most other types of development environments. And then if I just hit the play button again, my transition will complete and my application will start running also again. So the nice thing about the way that this development environment is set up right now is if I hit a breakpoint inside of state floor Simulink, since I'm doing co-simulation with the graphics portion of my application, the graphics portion of my application will actually also pause at this point. Now let's have a quick look at how the graphics is being integrated with the business logic. The block that you see on the right hand side of the screen, if we remember, is the main portion of the application that is going to be running the graphical portion. So if we look at this block a little bit deeper, we're going to notice that we have a DLL file that we're pointing to, which is representative of, of the graphical assets portion of our application that was created out of GL Studio. Then we can also select a class that is inside of that DLL file. In this case, we've just selected the class that is at the top of the application, so we're simulating the entire application. And then we also have the ability to add and remove imports from into the block, and then be able to attach those imports to the corresponding class property inside of the DLL file. 
Now that we've looked at how we can develop display systems inside of Simulink, the next thing that we need to begin to discuss is how do we verify this design that we've created. The next path that we need to go down is the actual automation of a test case and the building of a test harness. So up until this point, we've actually had our top level model where we were looking at the three different blocks, one being the portion that's controlling the switch inputs, one being the portion that's the actual business logic that we're developing inside of Stateflow, and one being the graphics portion of the application that's also executing during the simulation. Now we're going to use that harness that we've been using throughout this um, presentation, and we're going to use that harness to be able to automate our test case. The second path that we're going to go down is designer detection. And a more specific discussion today will be focused around actually dead logic detection. And de dead logic detection will work by basically going off and analyzing our model and then checking to see if there's portions of our model that we can prove that are actually dead logic and are, are not executing. And then by going down both of these paths, we also offer the ability to automatically generate reports. These reports can be stored off as artifacts or just be used to see the status of the overall simulation that was run. So first off, when we jump back into the model, we're going to notice that there's now a verification subsystem. The next thing that we're going to notice is I've actually branched off the signal for the center signal, which is going between the business logic portion and the graphics portion of the application. This signal is now being also fed into my verification subsystem. I also have another signal now that is called expected center, which is also being fed into the verification subsystem. And these two signals, actual center and expected center, are going to actually be compared against each other. At the same time, I have one other signal that's going into the verification subsystem, which is called screen capture. And what screen capture is going to do is it's going to specify multiple points throughout the simulation where I want to actually do a screen capture of the instrument cluster display at that portion of the simulation. So in this portion we're basically testing what we want to actually compare. So in this case we want to both compare the signal that's inside of our model against what we expect it to be. And then we also want to compare the actual image that's displaying on the instrument cluster at the same time. The next thing that we're going to talk about is previously and throughout the beginning of the presentation today, I've mentioned that the switch inputs uh, block that we have on the left hand side, we can actually change from one being in a manual type of mode to an actually into an automated type of mode. So simply by right clicking on this block and then say override using, I'm going to switch from my default of normal to a separate variant that I have for signal builder. So now we can take a look at the actual signal builder block that I'm using. And this is the actual signal builder block. So when we take a look at it, we're noticing that I basically have four separate signals that I've defined that are going to be fed into the business logic portion of my application. So these signals actually line up with the signals that are coming out of the switch input type. So I have my next switch, my previous switch, my set switch, and my cancel switch. So just by looking at this one test case, we're going to notice that we're going to basically press the next switch three separate times to scroll through the menu. Previous switch will never be pressed. Set switch will be pressed one time and then we'll hit the cancel switch. So this is basically going to scroll through our menu and then jump into the settings portion of our menu. And then when we hit the cancel button, we should then jump back out to the tachometer display. The last two signals that we see at the bottom, one being expected center and the other being screen capture, both are signals that are going to be used to actually test our model. So as I've stated when we were looking at the overall harness model, we noticed that I had expected center and actual center going into the verification subsystem. So this signal is actually being sent in throughout the entire simulation is going to be compared to what the actual value is during our simulation. The second portion that we have here is actually screen capture. And what screen capture is going to do is every single time I have a pulse here at different points throughout my simulation, I'm actually going to go off, take a snapshot of what is actually being displayed on the screen, and then save it off to be able to compare it later. Inside of Signal Builder, one also feature that we should, should note a little bit more is that by simply clicking the drop down here, I could have a variety of different test cases. So I could easily add 10 or 15 other test cases to this single signal builder block, and then I can click the run all button to be able to run all of my test cases at once. 
So now that we've discussed the signal builder block and the changes to the top level portion of the model, we should discuss the verification subsystem a little bit. So inside of the verification subsystem, we're going to notice that there's two separate portions. The first one at the top, we're going to notice we're actually taking the actual center value, which we're getting from the simulation, and the expected center against the signal that we create in the signal builder block, and we're going to compare these two to each other. So if at any point during the simulation these two do not match, our assertion block will be triggered. And this assertion block will basically let us either one, stop the simula simulation, which in this case we want the entire simulation to run. We do not want the simulation to stop whenever the two do not match. Or we can actually have a callback in this separate box. So in this case, I have actually a disp, disp command, which is going to say signals do not match. So throughout our simulation, if there's any point where the actual center value does not match the expected center value, we will display signals do not match inside of the command prompt right now. The second portion is the screen capture portion, which is actually this individual subsystem on the bottom. So as I said before, we have a pulse signal in our signal builder block, and every time that pulse occurs, we're going to go actually go off and actually capture the image and save the image for comparison later on. So at this point, we can go back up to our top level model, and we can actually run the entire simulation and see if our simulation actually passes or fails. So now that our simulation is completed, we can actually go back and take a look at the command prompt and see if the display command actually occurred. So that's one method of verifying if our actual simulation failed, passed or failed. So in this case, we immediately see signals do not match. So there was eight separate times that the assertion block was actually triggered throughout this individual test case. Also, while I was running my simulation, we can see that I have test points on each one of these signals, one on actual center and one on expected center. And I have results that are now available inside of SDI. So I can easily jump into SDI and then be able to see if or where my failure actually occurred between the two signals. So now inside of SDI, I notice that I have two signals, my actual center value, which I received from the simulation that was outputted from my business logic and what I expected that value to be. Now, if I look at expected center of what I expected, we're going to notice the two line up pretty closely, except for this one portion of our actual simulation. So when I transition from welcome to the actual blank screen that we noticed in our specification that should display for a period of time, we're seeing that the blank screen actually did not display for as long as it should have been. So in this case, we can actually go back into our model if I go down into the business logic and back to that portion of our model that we notice where I'm transitioning. So in this case, our welcome screen displays, it's sending a value of five to center and then a value of four. And then we should transition after a certain period of time to the, the main screen display. So based upon looking at that test case, it looks like this is actually not displaying for as long as it should have. So if I also right click on this transition, I've already linked this to my requirement I can jump to my requirement and then look at what the delay period is. And in this case, it's already highlighted in my document on the section of my requirement that was linked to that portion of the specification. And if we look at that link, we're going to notice that it says that after diagnostics are complete, I should show the blank screen for 500 milliseconds. And if we look at our actual design, I'm only showing it for 100 milliseconds. So by simply changing this, this should fix the issue with our design, and then it should pass if we were to do a second run. Now the other thing that we were doing while we were running the simulation is we had screen captures at a variety of different points. And we actually had five separate screen captures. So what I'm gonna do to be able to compare the screen captures that we actually stored off into the workspace is I'm gonna jump over to MATLAB and then I'm going to use this function here and this function of compare images and report back is going to basically go through. It's going to compare what I expect my values to be, which are simply images that are stored off onto my hard drive to what they actually were during the simulation. And then I'm actually going to have these other three functions, which are going to output the results actually into a 
HTML report. So by simply running the compare and report portion, it's going to go off and I'm going to generate an HTML file. And then I'm going to be able to simply view inside of MATLAB that HTML file by using the web command. So in this case, I had five different checkpoints where I had um, pulses inside of my test case to actually go off and capture the image. And then inside of this table, we're going to see this is what I expected the image to be. This is what it actually was in this column. And then this is an overlay comparison um, grayscale of the two. So if I look at every test case, I can notice that I've passed all of my test cases except for one. And then this is also saying I expected my screen to be blank, but I actually was displaying a car symbol. And then you can see the difference of the two images inside of the test case. So this is actually picking up the same design flaw that we had originally when we actually compared the two signals together. So by doing image comparison, we can one, be able to test the same same portions of the specification, but two, we're going to also be able to test that the graphics portion of the application is matching up to the interface portion of the application and that the system as a whole is working as we expect it to. Now, one other thing that I can do with this test case is, so since I've actually gone off and I've ran a single test case, and I get to a point where I'm happy with my results. So if, if I change that one value, everything should pass now. The other thing that I can actually do is I can go back and I can actually turn on coverage so I can see what portions of my model were covered by the test case. So by going to analysis and then the coverage option, I can turn on coverage for this model. In reference models, I can say, what kind of coverage do I want? Do I want just if a decision is covered inside of the model, or if a condition is covered, or um, MCDC if we want more of a complete coverage, and there's a variety of other items we can look for. I can set up cumulative coverage, so if I have multiple test cases, I'll get coverage for all of those test cases. And I also want to display my coverage results inside of my, my model. Then the one other option is I can also create a report so that after my coverage has been reported out, I can actually store that off into a location as an artifact. So I'm actually going to turn on coverage now, and I'm going to go back to my model one more time, and I'm going to rerun that test case, and now we're going to be able to see which portions of my model were covered by the single test case. Okay, so now that my test case has been completed, the first thing that we're going to notice pops up is the HTML report that I requested to be generated. So it's going to give me an overview of my entire model, and I can then drill down into the different portions of my model, and we can see already that my business logic, I covered 24% of the decision coverages at, the, at least that level inside of the model by just the one test case that I had. And we can actually go a bit further down in throughout the remainder of it, and it's going to go transition by transition and let us know which portions were covered and which portions were not. In addition to the HTML report, I can actually go into the business logic portion, and now we're going to see that my model is actually colored. We're going to see a red color over my menu transition um, state chart, and if I go a little bit deeper, we're going to see a coloring of the entire model. So if, if we look at it in this case, I just had a single test case, we're going to see that I transitioned from the tachometer at the start of my test case into the main menu, and then I transitioned into settings, and then when I was inside of settings, I jumped back out and back to the tach display. So it's showing all of the different transitions that I actually have decision coverage right now inside of my model. And also by clicking on each one of these links, or each one of these transition, it's going to show up inside of this window of exactly what the results are for, in this case, the decision coverage. So in this case, this transition was never evaluated for rotate display. So by using Simulink in this case and using both the ability to automate my test cases that I want to execute and also using it for coverage, it makes it easy to make requirements-based tests that will be able to cover a large portion of our model. So now that we've looked at how we can use a test harness to automate the execution of a variety of different test cases, the next thing that we would like to do is go down a path of using more formal methods. In this case, we're going to look at design error detection, which is part of our Simulink Design Verifier product. 
So to do this, we're going to jump back into our model and the portion of the algorithm that we're actually developing out of Simulink to be able to deploy down to our target is this business logic portion. So we actually want to go off and analyze our state flow chart to be able to see if there's any types of design errors. Now the mode that I have Simulink Design Verifier set up in right now is to go off and look at our model and determine if there's any sort of dead logic that's inside of our model. So to do this, I'm simply going to go up to Analysis, Design Verifier, and then I can go to Detect Design Errors, and then I can click on it for it to analyze our model. In this case, since the analysis takes a little bit of time, I'm going to skip this portion and actually just jump to the results. So I've already run Simulink Design Verifier on our model, and I can simply go to Results and Load, and then load the previous run of Simulink Design Verifier. So in this case, I've selected the last run that I had. I'm going to open it. And then my results window pops up telling me that after the analysis of my model, it has determined that I have 18 out of 326 objectives that are dead logic and 308 that are actually active logic. Now there's two separate ways that I can actually review these results. The first way is to click on highlight analysis results in the model. And similarly to the way that we looked at model coverage, this is also going to go off and highlight our model and show us the portions of our model which are active logic and dead logic. So since we've been talking a large portion of today around the actual center screen logic, we're going to zoom in on that portion. And when we start looking at this portion of our design, we're going to notice that the majority of our design is actually active logic, which it's all in green. But there is a portion of our of this section that is actually dead logic. So if we go inside of this function, which is determining what should be sent to the center screen, we're going to notice that this single transition here, if I click on it also, we'll see that it's telling me that the false statement for this actual condition is actually dead logic. So what this statement is actually doing is we're checking the tachometer logic parallel state to see if it's in a main menu state. And in this case, what Simulink Design Verifier is telling us is the only option here is that this logic will always be true. So if we look at our design a little bit closer, we're going to see this is going to become a little bit more apparent why this is occurring. So if we look at how we get to the portion where we're calling this function, we only call function A once we get into the main, main menu screen state. And to get to the main menu screen state, you basically have to already be in tachometerlogic.mainmenu. And if you're not, you will exit this state. And to get back to the state, you have to be in tachometerlogic.mainmenu. So in this case, the logic that we have inside of function A is actually redundant logic, and it's impossible for this to ever be false. So this is one way to actually review the analysis results. The second way that we can actually review the analysis results is simply coming back to the summary window, and we can actually go off and generate a detailed analysis report. So this is the analysis report. It'll gen generate also an HTML report that can be saved off. It'll give us some of the summary about the item that was executed or tested with SLDV and it'll give us some of the overall settings that we used when we generated the test results. And then it's going to list off each one of the objectives and it's going to tell us which objectives were dead logic and which objectives were actually active logic. So it's basically telling us the same thing just in a report format. Also inside of this report we have the ability to easily click on these links and in this case it's the exact same portion of dead logic that we were just looking at and it'll actually jump back to the model and actually highlight the portion of the model that's being referenced in the report. So now that we've looked at how we can design display systems inside of Simulink and how we can actually go ahead and verify that design against requirements and then use a few more formal methods inside of Simulink to do that verification, we can then take our Simulink diagram and easily generate code from our Simulink diagram that integrates with both hand code and the graphics portion of our application. Inside of Simulink, we've also shown many automation processes that can be used, such as signal builder blocks to be able to automate test cases. And we've also shown the ability to have active links between your model and your requirement that will eventually go down to the code level. Let's look at the implementation process in our model. Referring to the instrument cluster display block that produces the graphics, as I mentioned earlier, it uses a DLL file that was compiled inside of Visual Studio and imported into Simulink. 
So the code that went with that DLL file has already been generated from GL Studio. So we have code that goes along with that. Now the business logic portion of our application is the portion that we actually just developed out of Simulink. And if we go inside of the business logic portion, we're going to notice that this is the actual level that we want to generate code from uh, Simulink using embedded coder and be able to deploy this code to our target or to whatever environment that we want to run this code in. So all of these imports in this case are going to actually hook up with the interfaces that GL Studio is already expecting from their generated code. So by going simply going to code and then going to C slash C++ code and then build model, this is going to go off and actually generate code for my overall model. So now that the code has been generated, we can quickly see inside of our that uh, code generation report has actually been generated when embedded coder actually generated the code. So this is an option that I selected. So this report shows up. If we start going through our report, we're going to notice that I get a couple of summary items here at the top. It's going to tell me the model version number. It's going to tell me a few other items. It's also going to tell me um, I have a code interface report that I can jump through and I can see what functions were actually generated and if there were any arguments that need to be passed to these functions where the function was actually generated, the uh, header file that the function prototype was in. So in this case, we actually have two separate functions that were generated. One is an initialization function that would need to be called when the system is started up. And then another one is our business logic step function. So this is going to be our periodic function call that's going to need to be plugged into whatever scheduler that we want to integrate this with. So next we can kind of jump over down into the actual code that was generated. And if I jump into businesslogic.cpp, in this case, this is the actual C code that is um, generated for my state transition table. And as we're scrolling through this code, we're going to notice that there's multiple links that are actually inside of our diagram or inside of our actual code generation report. And all of these links that we see throughout the report are actually hyperlinks that will jump to and from the model so that we have traceability to see, in this case, what portion of our model is representative of the code that was actually generated. So in this case, I have a function that's called rotate display. And inside of Stateflow, I had a MATLAB function that was called rotate display that handled the actual rotation of the animation for the tachometer gauge when it rotated in and out when we were actually using the application. So I can easily click on each one of these individual links and it's going to take me even down into that MATLAB function that I had or into the portions of the state flow diagram, which we were just looking at. And it's going to show me which portion of uh, the design is actually linking up to that portion of the code. So now that I've actually generated this code, we can easily take this C code and actually go and integrate this into our overall application and then be able to build the entire application and deploy it down to the target. Thank you for walking us through that example. Now. That was an excellent example of how to apply the complete model-based design process for display development. Now, I know that we covered a lot of aspects of the design today, so let me summarize some of the key aspects. First, simulation helps you identify design errors early in the development cycle. So you do not need to wait for the target hardware to be available before designing and testing your algorithm. Next, Simulink integrates with multiple graphical tools for desktop simulation and deploying to the host and embedded targets. Next, we looked at how to test the business logic and the graphics using requirements-based tests and then how to automatically generate reports to capture these tests. We also used various verification techniques to catch design errors while you were still on the desktop. Finally, we briefly covered automatic code generation from Simulink and Stateflow models and saw how the code can be integrated with your other graphics code. So, hope you found this presentation useful. I would encourage you to try out MathWorks tools for designing your displays. To learn more about the capabilities covered, look at training resources and webinars that are available on the MathWorks website. Thank you for your time.